Oh, and let me turn that countdown timer off. There we go. Hey, everyone. Here we are today with Jim Tierney from Digital Anarchy. You haven't talked to Jim for a while. Well, since NAB, right? <laughs> yeah, since NAB. So not that long ago. Not that long ago. I mean, live on the air. So what did you yeah, think yeah. about NAB? Was it good for you this year? Yeah, it was good. Uh, you know, I mean, excuse me. Sorry. Um, you know, it was a little bit smaller than past years, but I think the people that, you know, needed to be there were there. So, you know, it was a, it was a pretty good crowd, actually. Yeah, I, th I think it was, um, it seems, it's uh, it's down from 2019, but it was up from last year. You oh, know, the numbers? Sure. Yeah. So that was good. I've enjoyed the last two years just getting back in person again. Some of these events that are, you know, they're, they're coming up. Now, did, you, did you go to IBC? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. We didn't have a booth there, but I went out there and, you know, did some meetings and walked the show. And that's that's totally back to what it was in 2019. That's great. Um, that felt, you know, just a totally normal IBC. I mean, that's a smaller show generally. I think it's 30, 40,000 people as opposed to, you know, 90,000 ish right. <clears throat> usually. I mean, I think last year NAB was like around 50, 55, somewhere thereabouts. Um, but, uh, but IBC felt totally like just it always has. Huh. I wonder what the difference is, just the European versus the United States? Yeah, maybe, man, you know, an additional six months. You know, I think we've all kind of gotten, or a lot more people have gotten used to going back to trade shows. Um, you know, I think seeing NAB uh, be successful was perhaps a big deal. But, um, but yeah, well, yeah, it's just a smaller show, I think, so. So the other thing was, what's that one that they have, that consumer one they have in January? Oh, CES. Yeah, that was gigantic last year. They, it, was, it, was like, it was like thousands over what they expected to, to turn up for that one. Oh, the one this year? You mean no, the one a year ago. I don't know what happened this year, but the first one that when people came back, it was way more than they expected. I was like, really? That's interesting. But it, it, I'm pretty sure it was way, way, way down from, um, you know, pre-pandemic. Um, but I, I don't follow CES that closely. I mean, you know, I go out there maybe once every three or four years just to show up and check it out. But Right, uh, right. I don't know exactly what happened there, but. Um, I think the first time they had it after the pandemic, uh, it was a bit smaller, even if maybe they got more people than expected. So they, yeah, yeah when we, when I went back last year, 20, in, in 2022 to NAB, it was, yeah. it was good. It was definitely a little bit lighter, but not, it was like maybe 20%, 30% lighter from 2019. And then last, this last year was up from that even, because it seemed like it was, getting more crowded again, you know, compare comparative numbers wise. So I, I mean, personally, I like getting back in person. I, I wasn't a big fan of the virtual events. I, you know, I, I attended some of them, right? But it's, it's not the same. Yeah, you know, you, you, you can't get a coffee with a friend or, you know, get a drink at a bar or go to a restaurant or whatever. So yeah, yeah, having a beer while you're staring at Zoom is just not the same thing. No, <laughs> no, it's not. If you know, I, Zoom if is I like, never have to do that again, I will be perfectly happy. I agree. <clears throat> I agree 100%. <clears throat> it was okay. It's better than nothing, you know, yeah. but it's not the same. It's not comparable to being in person. Now, I heard people, you know, they say, well, we can't afford it. We come from overseas. But that's the way it's always been. These these events have always been, you know, you got to get a hotel. You got to take off work. You got to get airfare. You got to buy a ticket. That's not unusual that nothing is unusual about the last NAB and this year's NAB and 
the IBC. I presume IBC is the same. People still got to take off work. Was that two days at IBC? No, IBC is like a five day show. I mean, is it a five day show? Okay. Yeah, it's um, it doesn't. I, I mean, part of the reason we stopped exhibiting at it was that I didn't think it needed to be a five day show. I mean, it certainly wasn't worth it for us. I mean, maybe. I mean, I, I think they have a lot of different. They have people coming areas like the Middle East and Africa and stuff like that. And so for that reason, it's, they come on different days. They don't all show up on the, on the first day, which oh, I see. is what, what everybody does at NAB. Right. Um, so I think it's, it's partly that, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's five days. It's really long. Maybe one day I'll get over there. The, the problem, I used to go to Europe quite a bit. I used to go to, I've been to England six or seven times. I've been to Paris one time. But the problem with the situation now is we have cats we have to take care of. Yeah. And, and I, can't, I can't enjoy myself if I'm worried about pets. It just doesn't work. You know, you're away from the, you got to trust people. So that's the situation now why I don't go back to Europe. But I'd like to, I'll, I'll definitely yeah, get back to England. Yeah, Amsterdam's a great city, so it's that's one of the main reasons. I mean, like part of the I mean, these days, main the main reason for going to IBC is to hang out with folks in Amsterdam. So, um, you know, it's a city I've been in. I don't know, probably 10, 12 times. So oh, okay. It's just uh, it's uh, it's a lovely city, and it's a great place to to have a beer with people. Yeah, uh, exactly. Better, you know. <laughs> yes, exactly. So we're going to talk about, today, we're going to talk about your new, your latest plugin that you have, Data Storyteller. Yep. So I, I, I got your video from your website. We'll play a little bit of that, and we can go through, and you go through, you know, and then we can stop it, and you can explain and go through, not play the whole thing all the way through without explanation, but just basically tell people what, how that developed data storyteller uh so it's a plugin set for creating data driven graphics charts maps stuff like that um you know data is something that i've been into for a long time um it's uh, i think a very cool way of looking at a lot a lot of the data that um you know we're surrounded with these days and uh, we originally did a chart and graph plugin back in like 2008. Um, and then that became a Red Giant product and then they killed it off. But, um, but this is another attempt at it. Uh, and um, it's just, I, I think it's something that uh, a lot of people need to do, even if they don't need to do it all the time. Um, it's something that not infrequently, especially for docs or for news or you know, uh, you know, corporate work, stuff like that, just creating animated charts, graphs, uh, maps that are data driven, you know, stuff like that. So. Okay. That's, that's a pretty good explanation. So you're the, you're the one that wanted to develop this. Are you the main developer, the main idea person in digital anarchy? Yeah, I'm the main idea person. Um, you know, I can do a little bit of coding, but I'm definitely not the person you want doing the engineering work. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> you know, it's I know enough to be dangerous, but that's about right. Normal. So, you know, there's my co-founder is kind of the CTO, uh, and then we have a couple other engineers that work on the different uh, products. And uh, yeah, so I can, I'm the one that drives most of the ideas about what we're going to do, what I think is, uh, what there's a need for. And, um, yeah, so it's just, it really came out of my fascination with data visualization. Okay. Let's, let's watch some of your demo video. Data Storyteller is a new set of plugins designed for creating data visualizations and animated graphs or charts. It works in After Effects, Premiere Pro, and Final Cut Pro, with Resolve coming soon. This lets you create data visualizations right within the NLE, making it much easier to tell the stories you're using data to support. 
One big feature is the ability to support multiple data sets and transition between them, as we've done here with yearly data. Now, my first question, is, is it out for resolve yet? Yes, it is actually out for, we, uh, that, that I think is, yeah, I mean, that's wrong. We, re we released it um, for all the host apps at the same time. So, you know, After Effects, Premiere, Final Cut, Resolve. Um, so yeah, it's available for all that stuff. So is it, I imagine it is a different coding for each one of those platforms? Um, slightly, you know, I mean, we, we've been doing this a long time, so we kind of have a system where we kind of write once and then, I mean, every, it's, it's mostly the same code for all the, for all the host apps, but the host apps all have different APIs. So the way okay. that, you know, we transfer an image from the plugin, uh, to the host app, uh, is different in each app, but, hmm. um, but the underlying code for the plugin itself is the same. So the build system just, uh, you know, just has the, takes our code and then uh, generates the hooks for each uh, host app. Because um, e each host app has a different way of like sending that data. Right, uh, right. And, um, and so we just, you know, we can write once and then just build out different plugins. Okay. Pretty easily. Let's watch some more of that video. Let me see, where are we? Videos, here we go. The plugin consists of two components, a plugin for handling the animation and a custom UI for setting up the data and the look of the charts. It's a very cool way of integrating data viz into your productions. We're expecting a release in June, but you can sign up for the public beta now. Just email beta at digitalanarchy.com. So obviously, it, that was for NAB. Yeah, that was, <laughs> was NAB video. Yeah. yeah, it was in beta. Yeah. It's out of beta. It's been out of beta for a while. So th from the way it looks, the so you use, the people use, I think, numbers in Excel data? Is that one of the primary ways you input data in for this plugin? Yeah, so you're, you're taking in data, you know, it's data visualization. So you're taking in spreadsheets, whether that's uh, CSV data, or it can import CSV files and it can import Excel files. Okay. Those are the two main. Yep. And then also I see on your website support for simple or complex data. What's the difference between simple? I mean, to me, my spreadsheets are all simple. I don't have any complex data that I know of. Everything's pretty basic. So what's the difference between simple and complex data? Well, complex in this case would be if you have, you know, like multiple data sets, say you have um you know yearly data on different demographics in the city uh you might have it for you know like 10 different years and we can link all of those up together and you know as you saw with the um the map and the press uh freedom index right um, those are all large data sets that have you know countries and um index numbers associated with it and you can take a whole bunch of those uh, spreadsheet files and link them up and create an animation as you move through time, you know, the colors on the map are going to change. Oh, I see. Okay. It's almost like three-dimensional data. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's three-dimensional in the sense of the third dimension being time, right? Okay. Um, and you can also, you can also take um, data that, you know, like most charts are just X and Y, right? So yes. You're like, you know, sales over time or something like that. Right. But you can also take in, you can also have more variables than that. You can have, a, you know, not only X and Y, but you can have another variable uh, defining the color. You can have another variable defining the size of the point in the case of a okay. scat bubble chart. Right. Um, so there's, the, when we say complex data, that's also another instance of it where you've got multiple dimensions uh, to your data, it's not just plotting it on the X and Y, but you know, changing the color and changing the size based on some other variable. I see. So it looks like this is going to be 
I would imagine that, that news organizations would like this for one client. Yeah, I mean, that, that was definitely one thought. Um, you know, we've talked to some documentary people that um, are pretty into it because they're trying to they're trying to tell stories. Right. And a lot of. Uh, you know, what is going to back up those stories is data. And so how do you visualize the data in a compelling way and, you know, tell a story with the data as well? Um, but yeah, documentaries, uh, you know, corporate work, of course, um, you know, that type of thing. So I think there's a number of different use cases out there for it. Was there anything, speaking of uh, IBC, was there any buzz at, at IBC? I mean, Black Magic, obviously. I mean, they, they, they put out their new cameras like the day before IBC and they came out with this I was watching the live stream Grant Petty and then he, halfway through two thirds of the way through he comes up with an app for the iPhone did, did you, nobody was expecting that I wasn't yeah I didn't I, I didn't see it um, I mean my, my impression of IBC was just AI 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 <laughs> Um, everybody had AI products and it was all AI all the time. Well, when I talked but, to you at NAB, the, the funniest, one of the funniest things you said was, we, I, I mentioned that. I said, it seems like there's, there's an AI buzz, not in reality. There's not, you know, things you can put your hands on, but a, the words AI. And you said, and I said, are you using AI? And you said, yeah, we, like everybody else, we sprinkle a little AI over, over everything. <laughs> I mentioned that to Sam Messman. He got a big kick out of that. He said, yeah, that's, that's what it is. Everybody's sprinkling a little bit of AI. It's like a spice you put it on. you. Everybody's going to have a little bit of uh, AI in all their stuff. So. Um, yeah. I mean, there are some legit uses, you know, like transcriptive, which was yes. you know, yes. fully AI-based, and you're, you know, you're getting transcripts, and those are that's there's some real value there yeah um, but i think a lot of the a lot of the stuff that people are kind of putting out there is very much this might work someday <laughs> type <of> stuff <laughs> um, i mean there are there are some uses there are some things that are working now there's also you know a lot of buzz around generative ai and i think that especially for video is is a ways off before um that becomes, you know, useful in a very practical sense. Yeah, for transcriptions and and things, it seems like it's it's working very very well. I have two or three different ones for Final Cut that I use, and it seems like it's doing a pretty good job. Accuracy and not a hundred percent, but you know, in the nineties, and yeah, so that seems to be working pretty well. An off an off question: What? mic are you using because your audio is very clear and i don't see any mic anywhere I, I mine's right here it. mine's right here outside of the uh outside of you but i don't uh, see any I'm mic anywhere the, i'm just using the macbook mic actually it's it's i'm amazed i thought you had a shotgun up above your head somewhere or something yeah, I'm just using uh, it's a it's a, actually one of the newer MacBooks, one of the M2s, but uh, but yeah, just using the mic on that. Just to build well, congratulations to Apple. That audio sounds really really good. Now I, I use mine when I'm in the field, but here I have a studio mic. I have a Neumann TLM 103 that you really you can't. So I just keep it just out of sight. I, I when I when I watch these people on YouTube and all, and they got these DJ arm mics. They're coming in from different angles and stuff and it's like, you know, they take up half the screen. Why don't you just have a mic on a little stand right here? You don't need those arms because that was that's for DJs that aren't on camera. You know. But they have it's like no, you just have a little stand with the microphone on it. It'd be it would be better. It'd look a lot better. But whatever, that's the that's the new trends. They have those multi. You, you can see all their equipment, and that clearly <laughs> makes them professional, right? Yeah. Well, it's for a DJ. For DJs, yes, because they're not on camera. Because they got to move the mic around sometimes and everything. But not on camera. Just put it put it on a stand. I mean, you can't see my mic. I have a studio mic. You can't see it. 
I just keep it just out of view. But it's, you know, it sounds good. It's a nice microphone and stuff. But I was wondering, where I said, where's his microphone? I don't see a lapel. I don't see headphones. I don't see anything. So. Yes, it's the lazy man's mic. <laughs> it's doing a good job. So what else? What else? Uh, so we have, we just talked about your latest plug-in. What else? We have Beauty Box. Yep. Is it is that probably your most popular plugin or one of your most popular? That's one of them. Uh, and then, you know, we're working on a new version of that, which uh, is what I was talking about, sprinkling the AI on. Um, oh, you are working AI on a new version. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the AI, the AI part of that is going to be uh, improving uh, the teeth whitening. So allowing you to, you know, whiten teeth. Um, and so we're using, I mean, it's, Old school AI, I guess, is what you'd call it. It's not, you know, like generative or whatever. It's just identifying where the teeth are. And then, you know, we can run a color correction pass on it. Okay. Um, but, you know, we are using AI to, to identify where the teeth are. Um, and so that's something we're working on. That should be out uh, fairly soon. Um, and then, uh, of course, there's Flickr Free, which is for, you know, deflickering flickering video uh, in all of the different ways that uh video flickers um and uh yeah and then you know we've got transcriptive and uh samurai sharpen which is a sharpening plugin right and do you have i presume you're working on new something new or a new plugin or two uh well right now we, you know we just got data storyteller out so that's kind of the newest thing um and we'll probably release a 1.1 for that pretty soon there's some stuff that you know i mean any 1.0 is going to not have all of the things that you wanted in it so right uh you know 1.1 uh so we're kind of working on that uh we're working on the box 6.0 which is the you know ai release of that okay um and so that's kind of the, the main stuff that we have going on right now um and then uh yeah, we'll see what other kind of new ideas uh, pop up after that. Now, are you the person who interacts with like Apple and the Fonica Pro team and Digital D and DaVinci Resolve team, or does somebody else in your company do that? Well, you know, it depends on what it is, right? Um, if it's on the engineering side, then uh, my co-founder Garrick would be the one that you know, usually interacts with um, Adobe and Apple and. Uh, black magic on the engineering side if it's more marketing or company related stuff then it's usually me that's uh, you know handling that stuff right I, i'm uh i mentioned to you that the uh, final cut pro creative summit's coming up november the 6th and one of th this is amazing to me i've i've never been but Monday, we're going to Apple Spaceship Campus. Oh, cool. They're taking buses, bus, bus loads of people after lunch into the Spaceship Campus. Now, to me, that's worth the price of admission right there because I, I don't know how else I'd ever get there. You know, I, there's no other scenario in my mind that I'd ever get to the Spaceship Campus. So that's always cool because typically we go, we've been to One Infinite Loop a number of times, 2016, 17, 18, and 19, and we, you get a presentation from the Final Cut Pro team. So that's very cool. This time, it'll be the first time that we go to the spaceship campus. I call it the spaceship. It's Apple Park. We've got to the gift center before, but we never got to the Apple Park, but this time, the second half of Monday, after lunch, we're going to Apple Park. I presume to see another presentation from the Final Cut Pro team and maybe a demo of something. Who the heck knows? November the 6th. We, we don't know what's going on with those people. We know, you, just, you can't guess. You, you try to guess, and it, sometimes you hit it, sometimes you don't. But right now, people are saying, well, where's Final Cut Pro 10.6? No idea. No idea. They just put out 10.6.9, so they put... Listen... They put out an update to Final Cut Pro for the iPhone 15 Pro Max. Right. I've, I've never seen them, I don't think, ever do a Final Cut Pro update for an iPhone. They've done it for the Mac OS, 
and they've been coincidental. They just happen to be at the same time. But this time, they put it out the same day that they entered the five, the fifth, uh, this 15 came out. That was 1069. Compatibility with, oh, Pro, ProRes Log. Apple ProRes Log. You can shoot ProRes Log on this phone. I've been shooting with it a lot. Now, the data size is really big, but it looks fantastic once you take it into Final Cut and apply a lot and do a little color correction. It looks really, really good. Very impressed with it. There's, so. a, way, there's a way to save it to an external SSD, right? Something like that. You, you can, with, so f at this point, you can record with the native camera app ProRes log to an external SSD. That's correct. You can't record H.264, and the, the actual SSD, the only requirement is ProRes log 60 frames per second. 30 frames per second and 24, this is 4K, and it's ProRes HQ. 20, 24 frames per second and 30 frames per second, you can shoot internally on the phone. If you want to, yep. you can also record to an SSD, but you don't need it for 24 and 30. And I almost always shoot 24. That's what I'm typically well, I mean, I'm depending shooting. On the length, depending on the length of the shot, right? Um, yes. Yeah, you might want, might not want it to consume half of your uh, infernal. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I got, I you got can, the. You, can, uh, if you want, but you know, like. Right. If I think, if I think if I'm shooting raw, then I. I you know, best practice might be to have the SSD. I don't know. Yeah. Well, it's yes. So the problem is the idea of the phone is it's portable. It's in my pocket. Now I got to carry an SSD, and I got to carry a battery pack, and I got to carry. No, I don't want all that. I want to just take this phone out and pull it out and shoot it. Now I do, I do rig it up. I do have a gimbal for it, and with my gimbal set up, I can attach an SSD and I can attach an external microphone, and I can do all that if I'm going to shoot with a gimbal. But if I'm just having it in my pocket and I pull it out, I can still shoot ProRes Log, right. ProRes HQ Log, Apple Log, and Apple has the built-in 1069, Final Cut Pro 1069, included the Apple LUT for that footage. So, But that was a very nice surprise. And the footage looks fantastic. I must say, I've, I've been very impressed with it. So... Yeah, they've been doing they've been doing get good cameras for a while. So, yeah, the 14 was great, and I have the 14 still. I've had to sell it. If it wasn't for USB C, I might not have gotten the 15 because this was the biggest deal to me. That lightning connector on the other phones is just atrociously bad and atrocious. It's USB 2 2.0 speeds. And getting, you know, hundreds of gigabytes of data off that, it's just torture. It's just, it, it is. I, I don't know what's wrong with them. AirDrop does, it works sometimes, sometimes it doesn't. I never use the import window in Final Cut Pro because that's been buggy, especially with phones for a long time. So I just plug it in and I'll either use the Finder or Image Capture or I use a third-party app called them iMazing and just drag the files over to the finder, and then once they're drug over, then I'll make a Final Cut Pro library. So do you do much editing yourself? Not that much. Um, you know, it's just mostly digital anarchy related type stuff. Um, you know, tutorials and demo videos and things like that. So, you know, I'm not, not doing a whole bunch, not doing it. I don't really have, <laughs> I don't have time to be out there, you know, creating documentaries or, or whatever. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't do a ton of editing. Uh, you know. Enough enough to keep me like, you know, occupied and you know, on top of what's going on, but um, but not really on a professional level. Right? Yeah, I was just wondering because I I I've been using well, Final Cut's my main NLE. I've been doing using it for over twenty years, but I also use DaVinci Resolve, which I really really like. I really like it. Some people say, oh, the complexity, the complexity. 
I like the complexity. I'm sorry. I just, you know, logic is complex. It's much more complex than Final Cut is. And I like that. I like getting in there and be able to get into the nuts and bolts and adjust things the way I want them and know how to do that. It takes a while to learn. And I also appreciate simplicity, but sometimes simplicity has a price. And that is yep. you can't do things that you need to do. Professionals. And I also use LumaFusion on the iPad. I edited my first 45-minute video 90% on LumaFusion on the iPad. And it was it's really, really good product. And I just finished the last 10% in Final Cut because I can do, just do the finishing touches quicker and I needed to get the project finished. But I did my first one. And the thing about LumaFusion is, you know, Final Cut came out for the iPad, right? Did you, are you yeah. planning on doing anything with any plugins for that? That's I don't know what the difference is. Nah, I mean, like, well, I mean, I, I'm not even sure if it supports plugins. Um, yeah. Oh, that's but, uh, that's, that's, that's right. a whole different market. You know, like I, you know, we're not really a consumer based company. I mean, most of the stuff we make is you know really aimed at professionals. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, the consumer market's a whole big can of worms. You know, people don't really want to pay for stuff. Um, and that's kind of the biggest issue. You know, right. It's like, you know, what are we going to do? Sell nine, you know, $10 plugins or something? Right. Um, maybe, but, <laughs> you know, our experience with, uh, you know, folks that are really consumer is that they don't really want to pay anything and they want more support. Yes. They want top tier support for $10. That's exactly yeah. it. And they were like, yeah, we like our professional customers. We'll just stick with them. <laughs> right. Well, the thing about, I've been losing, I've been using LumaFusion on and off for a while. But the thing about LumaFusion versus the Final Cut is, number one, LumaFusion works on my four-year-old iPad Air 2. Final Cut requires the most, you know, the fastest M2, M1, M2 uh, iPads. LumaFusion works on my phone. I can edit on my phone. LumaFusion works on Android. LumaFusion works on Chromebooks. And LumaFusion works on the Mac. You can, oh, If you bought LumaFusion for the iPad, you can get the M1 or you know, the Apple Silicon Mac version. All those LumaFusion runs on. And the I, Final Cut for iPad only works on a select, you know, modern version of recent iPads. So there's a big difference between the two. But I mean, if I get a new iPad, I'm not inclined to right now. I'll, you know, I'll try it out. But it's missing a lot of things that the Final Cut for Desktop have, which is what I expected. You know, it's missing like I yeah, have I a list of. Yeah, I Go think ahead. most of the iPad editing solutions are, you know, like, you know, they're not full featured editing packages i mean you know it's like you're still just doing it on an ipod i ipad right right so i'd be surprised if you know fcp like for example put all of the features of desktop into you know the ipad app um you know it's a it's a little bit of a simplified uh, uh you know editing right workflow which is you know to be expected i mean like exactly it, it, i knew from the beginning i said it's not going to be the all the features of the desktop i just i don't see how it could be and it's not it's missing it's missing a lot of stuff whether they catch up at some point or not that's that's up to them i like editing on a desktop on my macbook pro i really like it a lot so yeah you know i mean it makes sense if you're you know doing like TikTok videos or like youtube yep. stuff or whatever yep. you know it's like you know you're, you're not going to be doing all of the things that you would for like say a documentary or you know a professional cast type thing but um but you know if you're just trying to do a quick and dirty edit either just for preview purpose preview purposes or to crank you know kick something out on social media um or just to get you know the basic edit done before you send it off to you know your desktop uh, machine. Um, you know, there's lots of you know cool uh, you know the the mobile versions, but you know you're not going to get into deep color correction. You know, on right, that. <laughs> right. I mean, I wouldn't. <laughs> right. No, I, it's true. I mean, it's true. Try, but, you know. 
No, uh, it's, it, it just weird. makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Plus, the difference is keyboard shortcuts, using a mouse and trackpad. And, and yes, you can adapt the iPad to doing that with the keyboard and stuff. But if you're going to do that, why not just use a laptop? So what are you looking forward to besides AI going forward with technology? Anything else you're looking forward to? I know AI is, you know, dominates everywhere. I mean, when people talk about AI, I'm like, you know, I've seen the Terminator movies. I've seen Skynet. Now, is this where we want this stuff to go? It's just like, you know, it can be disruptive. It certainly can. I mean, the potential. So I'm not sure what the, what the ideal no. solution is. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a lot of science fiction stuff that, you know, we'll see where AI develops. You know, I mean, right now it's, it's, um, you know, I think it's helpful in some ways. And yeah, absolutely you know, very good at, you know, very confidently spreading misinformation. Uh, right. Well, that's, that's what I'm saying. And it can affect things, you know, the misinformation can affect things, you know, that's one of the ways, let alone um, the robots. Boston, was that Boston company that's doing robots? Boston? Oh, Boston Scientific. Yeah, and then, and then Elon Musk is doing robots, too. And it's like, okay, now we're getting AI, now we're getting robots. But I'm, I, as a joke, I always say, well, yeah, I've seen the Terminator movies. I see where this ends up, you know, and, and then what is the other one that the other robot movie the series that came out where they took over uh, like the matrix not not the matrix the um the one that had the uh blonde robot the woman the actress uh oh, james that. almost was one of the actors i forget what it was but it's the same the same story it's they yeah, sneak yeah. up on you sneak up on you just, just put a kill yeah, switch right, in there. Right now, I'm more worried about humans spreading misinformation than I am about you know, the bots. So <laughs> we're doing. <laughs> Absolutely, um, we got a high from Toronto. From Big Bot Studios. All right. Yes. The bots are there. <laughs> Big Bot. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So I'm looking forward to seeing what technology comes out going forward i mean we just had as far as nle's resolve just came up with a new version at ibc they came up with three cameras they came up with the the phone the uh, camera app for the phone which nobody expected um but i'm interested of course in final cut seeing what's coming up there now we're at 10.69 10.6.9 so i hope 10.7 is in our future and i hope it's a uh, a good solid update with lots and lots and lots of nice features. Yeah, I think for me it'll be interesting to see how generative AI, um, you know, if that gets applied to video in a useful way. Um, you know, right now it's it's very temporally unstable, so it just looks super weird. Um, but you know, just trying to understand some of the uses that you know, that might have in regular production. Right. Um, I think it's a ways off uh, for video. But Well, how do you, besides besides transcriptions, how else would you think it, it could be beneficial to video editors? What kind of things would it, you think? Well, I mean, I think there's a lot of stuff like color correction, um, you know, creating like basic edits um, that, you know, uh, you know, doing a lot of rotoscoping type stuff. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of like actual real practical uses of just normal AI, right? Um, not like the generative stuff, just like just going back to, you know, what we're doing with Beautybox, for example, just like whitening teeth. Um, you know, so I, I think there's a lot of, you know, good practical uses of it. Uh, but then, you know, you get into the more far-fetched type of things like the generative stuff. And, you know, who knows what that, you know, potentially, you know, gets into, you know, creating new backgrounds and stuff like that. There was one company demoing, uh, you know, like background removal with AI, which, you know, didn't look very good uh, at IBC, but, you know, it was 
maybe their alpha beta version of it and potentially sure. that gets better. Um, you know, that's the type of thing that, um, you know, creating a rough mask uh, around somebody uh, that's not on a green screen, it's just on a normal, you know, background. Like right, this. right. Um, you know, that's potentially something that uh, AI could, you know, make life a lot easier for rotoscopers. Right. Um, you know, so there's there's definitely stuff like that, that, uh, you know, places where it can help the editor. And I, I mean, I don't think it's going to replace editors anytime soon. Um, but I think there are a lot of uses where, you know, it can uh, be a beneficial tool. You know, another thing in the toolbox. Yep. I agree. I, I use, uh, which ones? I use Descript a lot which has some AI stuff. It had trans... I initially got it for uh, the transcription that it had a couple years ago, but now I stuck with it because it has the best audio editor of anybody. And, and the reason is it transcribes your audio. Yep. It places the, the titles, the, the transcription, over top of the audio in the timeline... And then you can grab a word and it drags the waveform with it. It drags the audio with it. I've never seen anybody else do that except them. So you can you can cut it. You can just take the word and delete it, and it deletes the audio with it. So it's linked. The audio or it's actually linked to all the. I mean, the transcripts are actually linked to all the audio yeah. pieces. So yeah. it's really well, really I mean, cool. Every, every, they, they all have that, but I mean, like transcriptive has that, but we don't have the audio editor. Right? So you can't see the waveform and stuff like that. I mean, like everybody's, you know, when, when you get an AI transcript, it has the time code. Every word has right, the time right. code. Right, right. No, I understand um, that. Yeah, so it all, you know, all the tools have that, but but certainly, you know, I mean, Descript, they, uh, I mean, they initially came out for podcasts, right? So it made sense that they had, I have a dog and she's. Oh, okay. <laughs> we like dogs. Uh, um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, they've had the waveform from the get go. So, you know, it just, it makes sense that they've built that part out. Well, that's a neat thing though. I mean, yes, you see, you, you can edit, oh, yeah. uh, you can edit, edit video with text. Absolutely. That that's, and uh, listen, I'm waiting for final cut to get that. Everybody's waiting for final cut to get that because everybody has it, but final cut. So we're hopefully that's coming forthcoming. So that is fantastic. It is really fantastic when you're doing video and stuff, but to actually drag the word around and the audio goes, it's just, they're linking them together. It was, yeah. It's very innovative, and I'm surprised nobody else has copied that aspect of it. So, it's a good tool, for sure. Recently experimented with AI language transition. With AI, you just feed it a video and it will do language transition, language translation on the fly. Yep. Huh. That's pretty cool. That's, that's another one. Hey, Jen is a site that does the AI translations. It's like it's like AI and translations and trend. Every a lot of people are doing that now. So you have transcriptive. That's for Premiere, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's for Premiere only. Uh, I mean, there is a website version of it, but we're currently not really building that out. Um, but I mean, that that was one of the, if we you know keep upgrading transcriptive. I mean, that's one area that look at is translations because um, a lot of you know certainly you can you know use the google apis to get ai translations okay um so it's definitely uh it's definitely a thing for sure very good and it's working uh you know it's, it's getting better as you know all the ais are right right so we got some uh Thank you for the thumbs up, everybody. They give us the thumbs up that they're as they're watching the the live stream. I, that's you know, I, I don't have uh, the ambition to do what some of these people do with YouTube, and they put out a video every week, and they do this and they do that. I do it because I enjoy it. You know, I enjoy the live streaming. Like right now, it's like having a TV studio in your home. This is my upstairs studio. And I can broadcast to the world. That to me is amazing. When I was a kid in single digits, I was a ham radio operator. Yeah. 
And it was the same oh, wow. kind of exciting that I could broad that I couldn't broadcast to the world, but I could listen to the world with shortwave radios and broadcast local. But it was the same excitement. This is like having TV or radio station in your house. So I've always, I, I, it is, isn't it? Just like right now, I'm talking to you. You're some, you're on the on the West Coast, I presume. Yeah, yeah. We're in San yeah. Francisco. Yeah, but people all around the world. Yeah, exactly, people all around the world watch watch these videos. We get responses. Yep. So. Is there anything else we want to mention before we sign off for today? Well, I think that's about it. Uh, you know, the company is Digital Anarchy. Our website's digitalanarchy.com. You can download the free demos of all the different products, including Data Storyteller, uh, which does work for Final Cut. Well, let's and, just... Uh, I'll pull that up. There it is, Digital Anarchy. And it's digitalanarchy.com, and you have all your, there's your blog, and you have support, and there's your plugins. Data Storyteller, Flickr Free, Samurai Sharpen, Transcriptive, and Beauty Boxes. There's Beauty Box right there, yeah. Absolutely. All of our stuff. All your stuff. And a new uh, version of Beauty Box is coming out, version 6, you said, at some point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 6.0 should be out before the end of the year. So that's, and that would be a free upgrade if you purchased it now. Oh, is that right? That's great. Yeah. Yep. And this is our demo dog. Oh, what a cutie. What a beautiful. If you download, if you download some of our demo footage, you will uh, see Miss Callie uh, in some of it. She's also the uh, director of IT obsolescence, so she lets us know that <laughs> she lets us know the equipment is obsolete by chewing on the power cords. There you go. Very good. All right, I think we're going to sign off. I'm going to get something for dinner. Something. It's five o'clock here, so it's dinner time there. It's is it two o'clock? Two o'clock. Yeah, it's two o'clock. Two. Yeah. So you you have ways to go for dinner time. Fantastic. We're finally getting fall weather here, which I like. It's uh, it's like 60 degrees out. And when I get up and I go for a two-mile walk every morning and I listen to podcasts and things, I really enjoy it. But this is the best weather to do that. It's like 59, 55 degrees, 60 degrees. It's beautiful. Put a hoodie on. You don't have to worry about it being too cold. Later in the year, I stay inside. I just ride my indoor bike for the winter time, so. Yeah, well, if it was 85 all year round, I'd be totally happy, happy with it. Is that right? <laughs> that, that's good. <laughs> that's why I live in California. California and Florida, it's the same. They, both people that live in both states love that. When I go to Florida, I have relatives in Florida. They, their houses are like 80 degrees inside. My house is 69 degrees. So. <laughs> I, I can't, I just, I just, I got to have AC when I'm inside. Outside, I don't mind so much. But when I'm inside sleeping and stuff, I got to have, I got to be pretty cool. 70 to 69 to 70, one or the other. Sometimes I get a little chilled and I'll turn it up. All right, Jim, it's been great talking to you as usual. And we will talk to you later. Everybody go to digitalanarchy.com and check out the plugins. You have, you said you had demos of everything? Oh yeah, there's you know you can just download demos and try everything out, um, and you know there's tutorials and there's some footage you can download. That, you know, of course, has Cali in it, um, and among other things. It's not just dog videos. Sure, <laughs> absolutely. There's other types of footage that you can play around with. Um, absolutely. But yeah, uh, you know all the stuff there, and then of course you can buy on the website as well. Very good. Thanks, Jim. I will talk to you again. All right, take care. Bye.